Have you ever just sat down and read some declassified CIA documents about humanity's ability to manipulate and perceive events that should be well outside of our natural perception? Well, if you haven't, then strap in. It's about to be a lot of fun. During the events of the Cold War, the state of two countries and the planet as a whole was quite uncertain. With nuclear capabilities that would render large swaths of land uninhabitable and the fear that at any moment those could come raining down on your population, both sides of the Iron Curtain were somewhat desperate to figure out what the other side was doing. Not willing to risk an outright incident that would herald in the end of the world and potentially the end of our species. Well, actually, you know what? Maybe they were because seeing as there's a lot of files that are still sealed, well, actually, we don't really know what happened. But the Soviet Union and the United States would use everything from spy planes that skirted the boundary and flirted with spaceflight to spies that would risk their own life if captured to proxy conflicts to more bizarre means of obtaining information. Eventually, as cold as everything was, it began to heat up exceedingly fast. In 1989 and 1990, the Berlin Wall would come down as nations in Eastern Europe would then have their first elections in a long time and then oust the communist leadership. Then by 1991, the Soviet Union would break apart into its original republics as the Cold War would have officially drawn to a close on December 26, 1991. This was a joyous time for many involved as they could freely move across the continent of Europe and barring any current attempts to reform the old union, it would remain this way. But what's most interesting about this is what would come out of this time frame due to the desperate need to have a leg up on the other country. The concept of human influence on the physical world around us is nothing new. Ever since our beginning, like we had witch doctors that believed that they could cause lightning strikes from across the planet. We know now, it's probably not reality, but you still do have people who believe that. Other claims would go on to say that you could see ahead in the future, or you could see through the eyes of others. But as we all know, this is completely fake. But do we really know that? Human history is sporadically populated by events that would seem to have no explanation that calls into question if humans potentially have the ability to influence outcomes on a quantum level. These events, and the long-running idea that there may be more to our perceptions and influence as an individual and as a species, has long been an interesting idea because it's such a just long-running theme throughout our entire history. Eventually, this would be put to the test to determine if it does in fact exist within Homo sapiens. In these declassified CIA documents, there is reference to one particular phenomenon that I find highly fascinating. Not just because the project itself was deemed as a complete failure, but because of the outcomes that potentially and very easily show that maybe it was not a complete failure. What's the old saying, the guilty dog barks the loudest? Well, due to the complete lack of communication between the Soviet Union and the United States, an idea was formed that is prevalent, again, all throughout human history. The apparent existence of psychics, people whose minds allegedly do not work on the same playing field as most, as they are capable of tapping into essentially a spiritual realm that allows them to see beyond what our meat suits are capable of. Specifically, what they were trying to accomplish is something known as remote viewing. For clarity's sake, essentially a person would be placed in a room looking at something. In another room, completely out of view or out of contact, sound, nothing, those people would have the ability to interact. So the remote viewer would then tell the judge what the other person was looking at. First starting as like a simple card, it would then get more and more complex over time, moving to pictures from National Geographic to eventually people describing places that they had not seen prior, but were able to allegedly through the eyes of the other person. This is of particular interest because eventually it would even start to manifest as individuals looking into the future and accurately describing events that were taking place. So before getting into the events that may have confirmed the existence of this paranormal psychic ability in Homo sapiens as tested by the US government, we must first take a look at the project's origins to identify the several flaws contained therein. Parapsychology is relatively new, but at the same time, it appears to have always existed in one form or another. Some would call it the occult, others may refer to it as a spiritual event, but depending on what you believe, it could just boil down to demons and the Lord. Regardless of personal ideas on what's out there, Anything relating to the psychology of humans, but considered to be sort of type of, you know, out there deal, like a fringe type of situation, is known as parapsychology. Within this sect of parapsychology lies the idea of remote viewing. Remote viewing is obviously something that would have been invaluable to both sides of the Iron Curtain. Imagine it. Uh, you want to know what the Russians are up to over there, and you can zoom in on a guy and literally see another guy picking his nose, and then that's how you blackmail him. That's how it works. Or you can look at documents, I mean, if you really wanted to. But 
Something to note is the Soviet Union was also attempting to do the same exact thing around this time because as mentioned, both sides were quite desperate to discover information on the other. Rosemary Gulley described remote viewing as seeing remote or hidden objects clairvoyantly with the inner eye. Essentially, it's an out-of-body travel. Now, this is a personal experience, so uh, <laughs> feel free to call me a crackpot. It's happened before, and it's completely anecdotal, so don't admit this into, like, proof of anything. Believe it, don't believe it. Again, it really doesn't matter, but I may have had a similar experience... And I know, hold on, it sounds ridiculous, but hear me out. So there I was, I was working the night shift, changing the shelves at American Eagle back in college for some money. I was pretty cracked out, as this is like an all-nighter type of deal. I drove back home at around 6.30 a.m. as the sun was coming up, and I was looking to go to bed pretty much immediately. As I got home, I walked inside, walked down the hallway, and I got into bed pretty much immediately, and as soon as my head hit the pillow, I was knocked out. I remember waking up with my hand over my face, and clearly what was a sleep paralysis dream type of deal. Like, my eyes were open, but I could not move. So, you know, like the whole thing in the corner, whispering your name, all that fun stuff, I got to experience it. I could deal with that, but what was interesting is I ended up sitting up, or at least thinking that I did. I remember my hand was still over my face, but as I did, I woke back up in my bed, still stuck. And I thought to myself, huh, well, I guess I'm just trapped here for eternity then, and, you know, <laughs> that was a little horrifying, but... I ended up getting back up again and then heading to the kitchen, but what was most interesting about this event was I could still see my hand in my vision. I looked at the kitchen counter and there was a box there and then I snapped back to my bed again as the sleep paralysis wore off. After my heart rate had come back down, because good lord I was definitely around like 180 beats per minute at this point, people actually do have heart attacks during sleep paralysis dreams, I went into the kitchen and found the same box I had seen earlier. But clearly, I hadn't actually entered the kitchen. I was stuck in a sleep paralysis dream. So now let's address the first thing. It's possible that I dreamed the entire thing, which is the much more likely scenario. The second possibility is at some point, I may have seen the box on the counter, but I had just, you know, thinking back, I don't remember ever entering the kitchen from the time I got home to when I went to bed. And apparently the box had been brought in the night before while I was at work and placed in the kitchen. The third possibility, it was just pure coincidence. And the fourth possibility is what the feds were testing out the potential for people to see into other areas. Although I'm not going to sit here and just be like, oh yeah, I'm just built different. Possibly it was just a weird experience from when I was 19 years old, but here I am at 31 now, and that has always stuck with me. So moving on, psychic phenomenon would be studied by many scientists that started in the mid-19th century. People like Michael Faraday, Alfred Russell Wallace, Rufus Osgood Mason, and William Crookes would conduct many experiments on particular individuals who were assumedly gifted, and apparently some of the tests would come back successful, but this was largely criticized by the scientific community and for good reason. A lot of the same issues present themselves when dealing with what is basically, how do we replicate these results? Which when retested, it almost is like virtually across the board impossible to get the same results. So that means it's not real, right? Well, not exactly as we will come to find out. Like with most things, there's a lot of nuance and complexity in the matter. The testing of parapsychology would go on from actually the 1600s, if you didn't know, where Descartes would write about how the happy man would win in gambling more often as if he had some sort of influence or impact on the outcome. This would run into the 1930s where a man by the name of J.B. Rhine expanded the study of paranormal performance into a larger population in order to get a better testing sample size. Using standardized testing protocols would give validity to the testing, even if what was being tested seemed a little out there. Conducting these tests using regular people, he would hold on to his research for fear of ridicule by his fellow scientists. Which, believe me, having worked in the lab, uh, there is so much politics and science, and it is so annoying. Mm. I think our species would be better off if there was just no politics in it, obviously. But that's just my opinion. But eh, you always got a jockey for funding. It's a sad reality. As time passed, anyone conducting these experiments using the human mind, strangely enough, would be sort of regarded as a fringe science type of scientist and heavily criticized as if they were doing something wrong, even though they are just examining possibilities out there that seem a little out there. But this would not continue. The 1960s were a time punctuated by free thinking, or so it's said, and an attitude of rebellion towards the old ways and established thought processes. This opened the door for some of these stranger testing protocols to slip through this small crack and come into view more fully. Essentially aligning itself with the new age thinking, this would be spawned out of the movement referred to as the human potential movement. 
Basically, they were looking at the human body and mind and really testing what our limits are as a species, because we actually still don't know. This would spark renewed interest concerning the public's attitude concerning consciousness studies and psychic phenomena. This would ultimately result in two men, Harold Potoff and Russell Targ, to come on board and begin their tests. Shortly after joining the Electronics and Bioengineering Laboratory in Stanford Research Institute, they would initiate several studies of the paranormal which at first were supported with private funding from the Parapsychology Foundation and the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Around the same time frame, two other physicists named John Taylor and Eduardo Balanowski had just completed their testing on an apparent psychic named Matthew Manning, utilizing the remote viewing technique and found it to be completely unsuccessful. From here, several studies would be conducted that would result in some very interesting outcomes, but all of them appeared to have a caveat attached to them. The tests were conducted in the same way I mentioned earlier. It started with identifying a card, then it moved to pictures, then the viewer was asked to describe the actual area the person was supposed to be viewing and what was around them. Any who had above a 5 to 15% success rate were deemed as a person of interest in terms of their capability. Now, here's the thing. There were people in the study who could describe what car the person was holding and where they were, or even looking around some areas that they had never been to. And this was of great interest to Targ and Putoff, as it seemed to confirm their suspicions that humans had remote viewing capability. But there were several issues. First, some of these tests were conducted in complete secrecy, and as a result, there are no transcripts to actually confirm what happened or how it happened. Instead, it's just all word of mouth, which just like the story I just told you, that does not admit it into actual evidence. Second, when asked to see the transcripts associated with the testing, Targ and Putoff would make excuses and just straight up not hand them over for years. So yeah, that's not exactly an ideal situation if you want people to like respect your studies. It might make people think that, hmm, I wonder if they're up to something. Other issues were found years later, which by the way, these studies did run for over 20 years. In the early 1990s, the Military Intelligence Board, chaired by Defense Intelligence Agency Chief Harry Soyster, appointed Army Colonel William Johnson to manage the remote viewing unit and evaluate the objective usefulness. Funding dissipated in late 1994 as the program went into decline. The project was then transferred from the DIA to the CIA in 1995. In 1995, the CIA hired the American Institutes of Research to perform retrospective evaluation of the results generated by the Stargate project. Reviewers included Ray Hyman and Jessica Utz. Utz maintained that there had been a statistically significant positive effect with some subjects scoring between 5 to 15% above chance. Hyman argued that Utz's conclusion that ESP could even prove to be existing is premature to say the least. Hyman said that the findings had yet to be replicated independently and that more investigation would be necessary to legitimately claim the existence of paranormal functioning. Based upon both of their studies, which recommended a higher level of critical research and tighter control, the CIA terminated the $20 million project in 1995. Time Magazine stated in 1995 that three full-time psychics were still working on a $500,000 a year budget at Fort Meade, Maryland, which would soon be cl Holy shit. Anyway, so the Air Report concluded that no usable intelligence data was produced in the program. David Gosselin of the American Institute of Research said there is no documented evidence that had any value to the intelligence community. Something to remember, again, just like it was stated, Targ and Putoff were receiving funding the whole time, basically setting them up for life so they had incentive to keep the studies going no matter what the results were. And they also had incentive to botch the information to make it appear like it was more successful than it really was. Some of the information came up as cues for the viewer to latch onto even if they didn't know that they were doing it accidentally. The psychologists David Marks and Richard Common attempted to replicate the Russell Targ and Harold Putoff's remote viewing experiments that were carried out in the 1970s at the Stanford Research Institute. In a series of 35 studies, they were unable to replicate any of the results, so investigated the procedure to the original experiments. Marks and Common discovered that the notes given to the judges in Targ and Putoff's experiments contained clues as to which order they were carried out in, such as referring to yesterday's two targets or that they had a date of the session written on the top of the page. They concluded that these clues were the reason for the experiment's high hit rates. According to Terence Hines, examination of the few actual transcripts published by Targ and Putoff shows that just such clues were present. To find out if the unpublished transcripts contained cues, Marx and Common wrote to Targ and Putoff requesting copies. It is almost unheard of for a scientist to refuse to provide his data for independent examination when asked, but Targ and Putoff consistently refused to allow Marx and 
Common to see copies of their transcripts. Marks and Common were, however, able to obtain copies of the transcripts from the judge who used them. The transcripts were found to contain a wealth of cues. Thomas Gilovich has written, most of the material in the transcripts consists of the honest attempts by the percipients to describe their impressions. However, the transcripts also contain considerable extraneous material that could aid a judge in matching them to their correct targets. In particular, there were numerous references to dates, times, and sites previously visited that would enable the judge to place the transcripts in the proper sequence. Astonishingly, the judges in the Targ Podoff experiments were given a list of target sites in exact order in which they were used in the tests. According to Marx, when the cues were eliminated, the results fell to a chance level. Marx was able to achieve 100% accuracy without visiting any of the sites himself, but by using cues. James Randi has written the controlled test by several other researchers, eliminating several sources of cueing and extraneous evidence present in the original test, produced negative results. Students who were able to solve put-offs and targets locations from the clues that had inadvertently been included in the transcripts. Marks and Common concluded, until remote viewing can be confirmed in conditions which prevent sensory cueing, the conclusions of Targ and Putoff remain an unsubstantiated hypothesis. In 1980, Charles Tart claimed that a rejudging of the transcripts from one of the Targ and Putoff's experiments revealed an above chance result. Targ and Putoff again refused to provide copies of the transcripts, and it was not until July of 1985 that they were made available for study when it was discovered that they still contained sensory cues. Mark and Christopher Scott in 1986 wrote, Considering the importance for the remote viewing hypothesis of adequate cue removal, Tart's failure to perform this basic task seems beyond comprehension. As previously concluded, remote viewing has not been demonstrated in the experiments conducted by Putoff and Targ, only the repeated failure of the investigators to remove sensory cues. The information from the Stargate Project remote viewing sessions was vague and included a lot of irrelevant and erroneous data. It was never useful in any intelligence operation and was suspected that the project managers in some cases changed the reports so they could fit background cues. Marx in his book, The Psychology of the Psychic, discussed the flaws in the Stargate project in detail. He wrote that there were six negative design features in experiments. The possibility of cues and sensory leakage was not ruled out, no independent replication, some of the experiments were conducted in secret making peer review impossible, and Marx noted that the judge, Edwin May, was also the principal investigator for the project, and this was problematic because it made a huge conflict of interest with collusion, cueing, and fraud being possible. Marx concluded the project was nothing more than a subjective delusion, and after two decades of research, it had failed to provide any scientific evidence for remote viewing. Marx was also suggesting that the participants of remote viewing experiments are influenced by subjective validation, a process through which correspondence are perceived between stimuli and are in fact associated purely randomly. Professor Wiseman, a psychologist at the University of Hartmanshire, had a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, or CSI, pointed out several problems with one of the early experiments at SAIC, including information leakage. However, he indicated the importance of the process-oriented approach and of its refining of remote viewing methodology, which meant that researchers replicating the work could avoid these problems. Wiseman later insisted that there were multiple opportunities for participants on that experiment to be influenced by inadvertent cues and that these cues could influence the results when they appear. These transcripts would shed a lot of light on the possibility that the test was not actually set up in a way that would produce reliable results. Because of this and the fact that when other scientists tried, they could not reproduce the same results, a variety of different scientific studies of remote viewing have been conducted. Early experiments produced positive results, but they have invalidating flaws. None of the more recent experiments have shown positive results when conducted under properly controlled conditions. This lack of successful experimentation has led the mainstream scientific community to reject remote viewing based upon the absence of evidence base, the lack of theory which would explain remote viewing, and the lack of experimental techniques which can provide reliably positive results. Science writers Gary Bennett, Martin Gardner, Michael Shermer, and Professor of Neurology Terence Hines describe the topic of remote viewing as pseudoscience. Others, such as C.E.M. Hansel, who evaluated the remote viewing experiments of parapsychologists such as Putoff and Targ, John B. Bishop, and Brenda J. Dune, noted that there was a lack of controls and precautions were not taken to rule out the possibility of fraud. He concluded that the experimental design was inadequately reported and too loosely controlled to serve any useful function. The psychologist Ray Heyman says that even if the results 
were from remote viewing experiments were reproduced under specified conditions, they would still not be a conclusive demonstration of the existence of psychic functioning. He blames this on the reliance on a negative outcome. The claims on ESP are based on the results of experiments not being explained by normal means. He says that the experiments lack a positive theory that guides as to what the control on them and what to ignore. And the parapsychologists have not come close to having a positive theory as of yet. Hyman also says that the amount of quality of the experiments on RV are far too low to convince the scientific community to abandon its fundamental ideas of causality, time, and other principles, due to its findings still not having been replicated successfully under careful scrutiny. Michael Gardner has written that the founding researcher, Harold Putoff, was an active Scientologist prior to his work at Stanford University, and that this influenced his research at SRI. In 1970, the Church of Scientology published a notarized letter that has been written by Putoff while he was conducting research on remote viewing at Stanford. The letter read, in part, although critics viewing the system of Scientology from the outside may form the impression that Scientology is just another of the many quasi-educational, quasi-religious schemes, it is in fact a highly sophisticated and highly technological system, more characteristic of modern corporate planning and applied technology. What a mouthful. Among some of the other ideas that Putoff supported regarding remote viewing was the claim book, Occult Chemistry, that two followers of, of Madame Blavatsky, founder of Theosophy, were able to remote view the inner structure of atoms. Michael Shermer investigated remote viewing experiments and discovered a problem with the target selection list. According to Shermer, with the sketches, only a handful of designs are usually used, such as lines and curves, which could depict any object and be interpreted as a hit. Shermer also has written about the confirmation and hindsight bias that have occurred in remote viewing experiments. Various skeptic organizations have conducted experiments for remote viewing and other alleged paranormal abilities with no positive results under properly controlled conditions. This entire study would be ousted back into the realm of pseudoscience and then scoffed at because of everything just discussed. But therein lies the problem. Many studies have been conducted in which much more controlled double-blind studies could potentially have shown, at least during this process, that humans have more capabilities than we think. And not even related to remote viewing, there are things that are done that show there is a possibility. And this means that this would be intrinsic to all humans and not just a certain individual. The project, again, would ultimately be terminated in 1995, seeing as the Cold War had officially come to an end and the project was not producing the results that they needed to necessitate its existence. Along with this, it was a $20 million project, so clearly it was quite a drain on the United States economy, but just wait 28 years, guys, it gets way worse. This entire project is one that is regarded as almost laughable that its existence, well, that it existed in the first place, I suppose, but I'm here to tell you that there are outliers that appear to possibly kind of throw a wrench into this whole thing that even with the study being mishandled it may have opened the door to people kind of reasoning that maybe this did actually happen in the way it did and we actually have more influence over the natural world around us i am of course though talking about the quantum random number generators oh yeah it's gonna be good on march 21st 2018 a study was published on the intentional observer effects on quantum randomness Essentially, to break it down for brevity's sake, this test was conducted to use the most absolute random number generator that could be used in which it was based on a quantum state. In doing so, they could ensure that there was no discernible patterns and instead it relied only on the potential of the human mind influencing quantum state. There has been a discussion for quite a while now whether or not humans can like influence the things around us. Like if we think of a number near a number generator, does that number come up more often? But if we think about quantum state, which then relates to a number, can we affect the quantum state that then affects that number? So the issue is it's impossible to make something completely random concerning the previous number generators for all intents and purposes, but using quantum computation or at least quantum states makes it much more random. Running simulated testing first and then human testing second they immediately were able to find a deviation in the results between the two. To quote the journal, we would like to emphasize that the conclusion of the evidence for no effect is only true when referring to the average mean score of positive stimuli. No deviation from randomness was indeed found with this score. A closer inspection of the temporal change of the effect on the other side revealed some potentially systematic regularity that was not present in the simulated data and can thus hardly be explained by random fluctuations alone. It seemed that the effect 
in its temporal development across participants behaved like a dampened harmonic oscillation, and the amount of oscillations found with the human compared to the simulated data clearly differed. Mayer and Champs and Press explained that the existence of such data pattern through the occurrence of the mechanism called entropy that counteracts the original micro-PK effect, their mutual interplay most likely produces a dampened harmonic oscillation. In this, admittedly speculative, assumption is true, future PSI research involving the quantum RNGs should not focus on significant deviations from chance, but rather should explore oscillating patterns across time and compare these with simulated data. This would be more fruitful approach than fighting a basic premise in quantum mechanics, and it would fit the law of conservation of energy and therefore avoid theoretical paradoxes within science. So in layman's terms, what they found was that humans did appear to have somewhat of an impact on the quantum state and thus have an impact on the number that would come up and this deviated outside of the simulated norms. Now again, take this with a grain of salt, but this test was designed with much greater adherence to protocols to make sure that it would be respected and could be cited as an actual source. So taking the idea that potentially humans could have at least some influence over a quantum level, there is an even stranger example that came out of the remote viewing test itself that didn't confirm, obviously, because, you know, this is the whole point, is that the test didn't confirm that we have it, but it did open the door to some strange things of why did this happen this way. So it appears, though, that there was some ability to basically come up with the correct, I guess, situations that were happening behind the Iron Curtain of even possibly future events that hadn't taken place yet. We'll go with the first one, radio listening post, Urals in 1974. A receiver volunteered to scan the Soviet Union for a radio listening post and claimed to have found one located at latitude 65 degrees, 0 minutes, 57 seconds north, and longitude 59 degrees, 59 minutes, 59 seconds east. And this was an insane amount of precision in pinpointing the geographical coordinates. The receiver then described in detail the geographical features of the surrounding site as follows. Elevation was 62,000 feet, scrubby brush, tundra-type ground hummocks, rocky outcroppings, mountains with fairly steep slopes. Facing north for about 60 miles, ground slopes to marshland. A mountain chain runs off to the right about 35 degrees east of north. Facing south, mountains run fairly north and south. Facing west, mountains drop down to foothills for 60 miles or so, some rivers running roughly north. Facing east, mountains are rather abrupt, dropping to rolling hills and to flat land. Area site underground, reinforced concrete, doorways of steel with a roll-up type. Unusually high ratio of women to men, at least at night. I see some hill pads, concrete, light rail tracks run from pads to another set of rails that parallel the doors into the mountain. 30 miles north, 5 degrees west of north of the site is a radar installation with one large 165-foot dish and 10 small fast-track dishes. The above report was verified by personnel in the sponsor organization as being substantially correct. Another one was a nuclear research center in Semipalestinsk in former Soviet Union, July of 1974. This was CIA's very first operational viewing assignment. The viewer was Pat Price. Pat was asked to describe the location at a suspected underground nuclear testing site in the former Soviet Union known by the code name Peanuts. CIA indicated that it was the first of great interest to them. They had in their possession a spy satellite photograph of the site. The viewer was given only the geographical coordinates of the site in degrees, minutes, and seconds. This type of viewing was been referred to as coordinate remote viewing. Pat was also told that the site was an R&D test facility. The government's representatives decided that if the viewer described either the known multi-story crane or odd structures resembling oil well derricks, then they would continue. Pat's description of this remote site in his own words was, I'm lying on my back on the roof of two or three storied brick building. It's a sunny day. The sun feels good. That's the most amazing thing. There's a gigantic crane moving back and forth over my head. As I drift up into the air and look down, it seems to be riding on a track with one rail on either side of the building. I've never seen anything like that. This viewing assignment continued for a couple of weeks, during which he drew pictures of the gigantic gantry crane and many other items on the site such as a cluster of compressed gas cylinders which were also visible in the satellite pictures. The gantry crane was moving on eight large wheels, two on each of the four legs. This unique feature was confirmed by satellite photos. 
You can actually look up a picture of the drawing compared to the satellite photo, and that can be seen in Ed May's website, www.lfr.org. In later sessions, Pat described the activities in the interior of the building on top of which he was lying earlier. He explained that people were assembling a giant 60 foot diameter metal sphere using thick metal gores like sections of an orange peel, but the workmen were having trouble welding it all together as the pieces were warping. They were therefore looking for a lower temperature welding material. SRI researchers were later told that the site was the super secret Soviet atomic bomb laboratory at Semipalatsky. They also learned three years later from a news item published in Aviation Week magazine that the sphere, which was about 58 feet in diameter, was intended to capture and store energy from a nuclear-driven explosive or pulse power generator. Russell Targ has commented that the accuracy of Price's drawings is the sort of thing that I, as a physicist, would have never believed if I had not seen it for myself. Another one was a spectacular example of precognitive remote viewing. This was carried out by Joe Moneagle in September of 1979. His mission was a spy satellite photograph had shown suspicious heavy construction activity around a building located 100 meters from a large body of water somewhere in northern Russia. The National Security Council, or NSC, wanted to know what was going on there. Joe was given only the geographical coordinates, latitude, and longitude and asked to describe the site. When Joe said it was a cold location near a body of water with large buildings and smokestacks, etc., NSC was satisfied that he was probably at the right site. They then showed him the satellite photograph in their possession and asked him to find out what was going on inside the building. Joe said the interior is very large and noisy. Active working area full of scaffolding, girders, and blue flashes, probably arc welding. He took a break and continued another session. Probably a huge submarine under construction. Draws a sketch with dimensions. A long flat deck, strangely angled missile tubes around 18 to 20 in number. A new type of mechanism to drive the submarine, possibly nuclear powered, and a double hull. At this point, the NSC representative figured out that Joe must be wrong because if what he said was true, it would be the world's biggest submarine. No US intelligence agency had ever heard of it. The US did not possess a submarine this large. Besides, who would want to build a submarine in a building so far from the water? Where would they launch it? But since Joe had acquired the reputation of being very accurate, NSC asked him to view the future to find out when it would be launched. Joe scanned the future month by month, and he said the Russians would blast a channel to connect the building with the body of water and launch the submarine in four months. In January of 1980, exactly as predicted by Joe, spy satellite pictures confirmed the launching of the world's biggest submarine after construction of an artificial channel connected the building to the water. It had 20 missile tubes, a large flat deck, exactly described by Joe. This is cited as bringing out the non-local nature of consciousness not only in space but also in time and even into the future. The next one was a location of a hostage being held in Lebanon in February of 1988. The U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency asked where Marine Colonel William Higgins was being held as hostage in Lebanon. A viewer said Higgins was in a specific building in a specific South Lebanon village. A released hostage later confirmed that Higgins had probably been in that building at that time. Another example would be the precognitive remote viewing that happened in 1989. The Pentagon asked a viewer about a possible Libyan response to U.S. criticism of chemical weapon works in Rabata. The viewer's response, a ship named Potua, or Potua, would arrive in Tripoli and transport chemicals to an eastern Libyan port. A ship named Batato, in fact, arrived in Tripoli and loaded undetermined cargo which was transported to the eastern Libyan port. These outlying events are of great interest because it didn't so much involve like just a picture or something that could be confirmed because it hadn't happened yet. Now this is not to say that coincidences cannot happen, but these specific predictions, so to speak, or remote viewings of the future would be a notable result that would likely make a person wonder if potentially the program was worth funding. These being just the declassified documents and the fact that, I mean, let's be real here, it's a Fed program, and with that comes the idea that we're probably not being told everything or not all the information is just released, just the safe stuff. It does make you wonder if there were other outcomes that were ultimately not released as it rendered actual valuable information. Could it be possible that there are those who do have non-localized consciousness and are more in tune with using it to tap into other areas to see things they shouldn't be able to? Or is it really just all coincidence? If you ask me, being a biologist, referencing that I'm actually in the science field, or at least before I joined YouTube, I was in the science field, I think the important thing is always to remember humans, hilariously, we know very little about anything. 
The common person thinks it's all just said and done and we have figured it all out and we're good to go. But if you talk to someone who is just so far beyond a normal person's level of comprehension, they'll tell you that nothing is assured. We aren't even 100% sure at this point how our brains operate and function on a fundamental level. How is it possible someone damages a small part of their brain and they're basically a vegetable while a youngling has a cyst grow to encompass 90% of the space their brain would normally take up and then when it's found, there's no discernible difference in their ability to think and learn? This is the reality to bear in mind when approaching things that seem far-fetched. The science is never just settled because there always seems to be something that proposes an issue later. So whenever you hear the science is settled, call that person an idiot because it's not.